How many of you believe that we serve a great God and that he is absolutely worthy of our praise? He is awesome. We have seen him do some amazing things here at Island Community and, and uh, in my family's life recently. So just so thankful. So thankful that I get to be a part of a church that just really loves to get together and praise the Lord, to worship him, and just to uh, come and to dig into God's word, which is what we are going to do today. So uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 4. We've been working through these handful of verses uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, so we're going to be week four today, and next week will be week five. And I think that's it. Uh, but I make no promises, but we shall see. But Philippians chapter 4 um, is such a great chapter. Really, the whole book of Philippians is great because there's, um, j- it's just chock full of joy and encouragement, and, and it's, it's, it's a great book. You should just go read it sometime. It'd be good for you. All right, Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Here we go. You're going to recognize these verses. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, before I give you the title for the message today, I want to give you kind of a little bit of Um, insight into my thought as I am studying and as I am um, preparing for this, I I, I always, usually, usually, I hope I have a direction on where I'm going when I'm studying, and I sort of know what the end result is going to look like, but oftentimes God just kind of takes me in a little bit of a different direction and that, so I've got some sermon titles that didn't quite make it. You you guys want to hear some of those? I kind of give you a a little bit of a thing. Um, So, One of them is right living begins with right thinking. Not bad, right? Not terrible, okay. Um, New thinking, new living. That one was okay. I liked this one. Today's thoughts determine tomorrow's actions. That's good. Um, I also thought about this one, but I really decided against it. What are you thinking? (laughs) Which could be like, like, hey, you know, what, what is it that you're thinking? Or it could be taken like, dude, what are you thinking? I'll let you decide how it was going in my mind. Um, but I landed on this one. So the title for today is The Path to Overcoming Anxiety, Part 4, Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life. It's okay, right? Did I pick the best one? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Okay. So speaking of thinking, some important things we have to get uh, taken care of here first. What do you call a crustacean who is always thinking of himself? Shellfish. <clears throat> yep, they, just, they get better, don't worry. Um, I was thinking, if a parent is trying to put his child to sleep and the child is refusing... Wouldn't it be illegal because technically the child is resisting arrest? But then I was thinking it's a lose-lose situation and it's illegal either way because uh, if the child willingly goes to sleep, then it could be considered a kidnapping. They get better every week, don't they? (laughs) All right, so we said last week it it, it wasn't a groundbreaking statement, but it really was something important for us to understand to really put our minds in this uh, train of thought, if you will, to understand where I'm coming from and, and the importance of thinking. So here it is. What we think and what we believe controls our worldview 
outlook on life and the actions we take. So notice it says, what we think and what we believe controls pretty much everything. Now, I'm all for setting goals and having vision and, and, and getting a degree and, and all of these things, and you can make all of these plans, okay? And you can have an end result in mind. But what you think and what you believe will actually be the things that get you to that end res- Whatever you think and believe, that's what's going to control your worldview and where you end up in life. We said a couple of things last week, like if you think or believe that God will protect you throughout all challenging circumstances in life, you will live with the peace of God. Like, like if you know God has got your back, he is going to protect you no matter what. Yes, are you going to go through some things, but God's going to be there with you through those things. You will live with the peace of God even in the middle of those circumstances. Here's another one. If you think or believe God has an amazing plan for your life and has made, quote, many great and precious promises to you, you will look forward to the next day. Change your thinking change your life. Now, I said one more last week, and I want to expound on it a little bit because I want to I want to explain something here, but here's what I said last week. I said, if you think or believe you are a victim in most or all circumstances in life, you will constantly feel oppressed and victimized. Now, I want to explain because I thought about this after service, and I talked to somebody about it, when I said that, I really wanted to convey those who are not presently experiencing something to where they are truly being victimized or, or hurt. What I didn't want to do, and I say this a lot, what I never want to do is marginalize or play down uh, those who have been hurt, who have experienced true pain. I never, ever, ever want to downplay that. But it is popular, if you will, right now, that to live with a victim mentality, and God is very clear in Scripture that he does not want us to live with, in victimhood. He wants us to be victorious, amen? And, and that could be for those who really aren't experiencing anything, like really, that, that's not, uh, you, you're going to be okay, all the way through those of us who have experienced deep pain and hurt and trauma in our lives. So if I didn't say that in the right way last week, or I made it sound like I wasn't giving credit or um, really speaking into those of you who have been hurt, I apologize. That's not what I meant. But here's what I really want to say in this. If you think or believe that you are victorious because Christ is victorious, and here's a verse, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, you will have an outlook of victory, not victimhood. Amen, right? Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so last week we said, I think, therefore I do. Our thoughts, our beliefs control what we do. Again, not our goals, but what we think and what we believe. So last week, we left off on a cliffhanger. I like dropped the bomb on you and then we ended. So last week I said we were gonna get to three God-honoring ways of thinking that lead to God-honoring doing. So, but I hate to say I lied last week. I said we were gonna do three ways. We're gonna get to one today. So we'll cover the next two next week. But three God-honoring ways of thinking that lead to God honoring doing. Now, before we move forward, maybe you're new here, maybe you're new to this Christian thing, maybe somebody just asked you to come to church and you don't buy into any of this. And I understand that the God honoring doing part doesn't sound super appealing, maybe, but I I will make you a promise. And this is a promise that I have experienced through the years in my life that when you finally decide to give your life to Christ, when, when you finally decide, hey, God, you know what? I've tried it on my own enough. It's, to, it's not working. Like, I've tried everything under the sun. As King Solomon said in Scripture, like, everything under the sun, it, it was at my fingertips. I could do whatever I wanted to do, and it's all vanity. It's all worthless. 
But when you really try to live your life in a God-honoring way, you will be blessed. Now, that's not the motivation why we do things, but you will be blessed. You will have peace in your life. You will have joy in your life. You will experience just, just fun, joyful emotion even in the middle of all of your junk that you're going through. There is just this peace that says the peace that passes all understanding that you will experience. And again, many of us have tried it our own way. So again, if you're new at this, I want to encourage you, try it God's way. See if this God-honoring living makes a difference in your life. Again, not honoring him just so that you'll be blessed and happy, but because we want to honor him. And in doing so, God's word promises us, man, that's so much better than anything that we ever tried. So three God-honoring ways of thinking that lead to God-honoring doing. Number one, we have to think constantly but correctly. Number two, we have to think biblically. And number three, we need to think actionably. Now, I don't really know that actionably is a word. I think it is, but it doesn't mean what I want it to mean. But see, I get the microphone, so I get to make up words and use them whenever I want, okay? Is actionably a word? I don't know. I don't, nobody said yes, so okay, probably not. But I mean, produce action. We need to think in a way that produces action, but that didn't fit in the... Anyway, okay. So according to Scripture, obviously, thinking is extremely important. We never, ever, ever just want to cruise control through life. Proverbs 23, 7, we read it last week, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. And how you think about all areas of life shapes who you are and how you act. Just listen, these are just three verses of many in Scripture that talk to us about the value or importance or the command of thinking. Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Reason, what does reason mean? To think. Let us, let us put our heads together. Let us reason together. Get on my page. Think about things. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. What do you do in your mind? awesome. Okay. I'm getting something out of this if you guys aren't. Okay, just say it. All right. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed from lack of doing stuff. No, from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Now, I often say to not just take my word for it, right? I mean, I'm I'm telling you this all the time, but to Look up these verses. Look up these principles. D- don't just come in. Now, now, do I believe that, yes, God in, in some crazy way speaks to me throughout the week and I put a bunch of stuff down on paper and come and present it to you and back it up with God's word? Do I believe that? Absolutely. Hopefully you believe that too. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here. But I never want you to just take my word for it. I want you to think about it. I want you to try to find things because guess what? I'm still human. I still make mistakes. I've said wrong things up here that I've had to come and correct or, or whatever, but I want us all to dig in to say, hey, I don't want to just take his word for it. I want to really see, hey, is that really, ch-? like, like, wait a minute, you're telling me if I just follow what God wants me to do, my life is going to be so much better. Yeah, that, that is one of the massive major themes in God's word. There is um, an, a, an author that said this thing, and it's like, He said, the heart cannot rejoice in what the mind rejects. Isn't that good? Your heart, like I, I, I can get up here and pour out my guts, right? Just preach to you everything I've got. And, and I mean, I'm like, I'm handing you the keys to life, 
just right there on a silver platter. And if your mind is not accepting it, you're, you're like, ah, I don't know. I, I'm still, it, that doesn't fit in with my life. If your mind rejects it, it, it you'll, you'll never experience it. The heart cannot rejoice in what the mind rejects. There's a story in the book of Mark, and Jesus is, is teaching and he's talking about parables. And the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders at the time, they, they come up and they just put Jesus on blast, right? I mean, they're just like, Jesus, listen, we just watched your disciples eat, and they didn't wash their hands. Seriously, that's what they said, because it, kinda, it broke some ceremonial laws and things that they had, and the Pharisees were flipping out about this. So Jesus, he tells a parable, and it goes on. So they ask him about it afterwards. So in Mark seven seventeen, Jesus says this, After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? Now, he's talking about food, okay? This passage gets a little bit descriptive, but we're mostly adults in here, okay? Verse 19, for it, talking about the food, it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. It's, it, it says it right there, okay? And then it's interesting that Mark puts in parentheses, he puts his own little emphasis in there, and he says, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Verse 20, he went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. Now, he's not talking about food. Now he's talking about what comes out of our mouths and our actions. What comes out of a person is, is what defiles them. For it is from within... Out of a person's what? Heart that evil what? Thoughts come. And then he gives us a list. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. So everything starts, as we said last week, everything starts in your thoughts, in your mind. And when it comes out in in whatever language and whatever attitude that you have, however you treat people, that's how it comes out, and that's what defiles or or makes a person dirty would be a, a translation of that. Sinful. Shameful. So Scripture is constantly challenging us to think, but in a God honoring, correct way. So let's talk about the first God-honoring way of thinking that leads to God-honoring doing. That's number one, think constantly but correctly. Constantly but correctly. And when I say correctly, I mean not incorrectly. We need to think constantly but not incorrectly. We've got to be careful about our thinking. Another way to say it is that we need to challenge our worldview. We need to challenge what we've learned. Like, like over the years, and, and we've learned some things, haven't we? You've learned a lot of great things, and you've learned a lot of bad things. And in that, we have learned in a way that it shapes how we automatically see situations. Our worldview will just, boom, something will happen and immediately we will react to it. Why does that happen? It's because of how we've been taught. It's our worldview, what we believe, what we think. And it automatically comes out and we've got to be so careful about our worldview. I want to ask you a question. And this is a big question and I want to give us all a second to think about it, because this question will really press down deep about what's important about what we're talking about. Here's the question. What if you are often making decisions that actually draw you away from God's word, God's will, and God's plan? Think about it, because your natural reaction is going to go, no, not me, but that's not true. Every single one of us does this, but there's a key word in there. The word is often. What if you are 
often making decisions that draw you away from what God wants for you. See, no one, I say no one, I hate using absolutes, but pretty much no one tries to make bad decisions, do they? You ever, you ever tried to make a bad decision? No, now, maybe you've purposely not made the right decision because the wrong decision was a lot more fun. Anybody ever done that before? Come on, everybody ought to be raising their hand. That's what we do. We choose the fun option or we choose the, what other option do we choose? The easy option. The fun and the easy option oftentimes aren't the right option, are they? So here's what happens. We let our feelings get in the way. We let how we feel about things and what's convenient in our life, and, and we let all of those things get in the way of making true God-honoring decisions. In fact, there's a, a phrase that I love that it really brings me into check because Scripture is very clear. In Jeremiah, and I quote this verse all the time, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Let that sink in. Your heart is the most deceitful thing that there is. So that whole advice about just listen to your heart is wrong. And so when we allow our feelings to drive us, we make terrible, not God-honoring decisions. So there's a, a phrase that I really, really try to live by, and that is facts over feelings. What are the facts of God's word that trump my feelings all day long? I've got to keep my feelings in check. Here's another way to say it. God's principles over our preferences. Do we live like that? How about God's word over our wants? God's instruction over our opinion One more, God's direction over our desires. And see, when we start to live like that, thinking about the future of God, what do you have for me? That's when things start to change. I was having a conversation with somebody a while back, and they were asking me about some options and things in the future and uh, setting some goals and things like that. And as we spoke it just kind of occurred to me, I think just God just dropped this little message in my mailbox to tell this person to say, hey, listen, I want you to think about five or ten years down the road. <clears throat> I want you to, to set some goals that would be God-honoring goals. Now, they, you know, oh, I want to be a pastor. No, 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 I'm just saying goals in your life that would honor God, okay? So I want you to think of some goals in five to ten years from now, okay, Spend some time doing that. And between now and five or ten years, I want you to only make choices that lead you to those goals. And it was like, with both of us, it was like, it's that simple. It just, follow what God has for you, what God has instructed for us. Think about what's in God's word and do it. And you will achieve those goals. Now, now maybe God's going to refine those goals. I'm not saying if you set a goal and you believe in God, you're going to, you know, Philippians 4, 13. I'm not saying that, okay? But what I am saying was God, God will refine those goals. God will, will mold you in a way. And if you are honoring him, he will honor you. Think constantly, but correctly. There's a website by the Cleveland Clinic called healthybrains.com, and there was an article called You Are Your Brain. We're going to get a little science nerdy. I kind of like this stuff, but I just want to read what it says. And this was in this article, but I kind of verified it in some other sources. Uh, I mean, everything, everything that you find in Google is true, right? Okay, cool. All right, so it says, your brain 
is a three-pound universe that processes, are you ready for this? 70, 70,000, 70,000 thoughts each day using 100 billion neurons that connect at more than 500 trillion points through synapses that travel 300 miles per hour. Let that sink in. Or a bunch of nothing got together and exploded and there was some pond scum and monkeys and here we are today. Sorry, cheap shot. I know, I know, I know. Okay, it's just in me, okay. 70,000 thoughts per day. Now, hearing that number, does that maybe bring into focus the importance of this message today? Just how we really have to be conscious of our worldview and how we think about things and what we're thinking in our thoughts in 70,000. Now, granted, only about 35,000 of them or only about half of them are, are conscious thoughts. Like we just do things sometimes that we don't even have to think about. But they say about 35,000 of them, half of our thoughts, we actually have to make a decision. And I get it. Like, some decisions are, you know, arbitrary. They're not really a big deal. Like, is it going to be a Reese cup or a Snickers, right? Like, I don't know how you honor God in that Maybe honoring God is not eating them, but I don't know, whatever, okay? I worked out today, okay? Stop. So, Snickers? Reese cup? Oh, yeah, Reese cup all the way. Okay. So, some of those decisions are arbitrary. Some of them really don't mind. But I would say of 35,000 decisions, there's probably some pretty important ones in there, right? I was talking to Nikki yesterday and kind of sharing some of my message, and she said, oh, that reminds me of a book that I read, and she had it on audiobook, and she uh, found this part, um, and, and it, it, it's by Jenny Allen. It, it makes this quote. It says, the greatest spiritual battle of our generation, you ready for this, is being fought between our ears. Wow. 35,000 conscious thoughts in a day. So, okay, sometimes they're little, sometimes they're no big deal, but how about the decision on how to respond to your spouse when they come in through the door and they've had a really bad day and they just kind of unload at you? How you handle that situation, would that be an important decision? And all the men said... Amen. Ladies too. How you make that decision, that is that that determines the rest of your night, doesn't it? Yep. I see the ladies are like, yes. Okay. Um, How about the decision of whether or not you should fudge numbers at the office or on your taxes? Is that an important decision to make? Could there be long-term ramifications if you make the wrong decision on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, How about this one? We'll take a little bit of a turn. How about the decision if you decide to follow that prompting by God to stop what you're doing in your day and help someone that needs some help? Ooh, you like the sin ones better, huh? I think it's really important on how we see those situations, what you think about those types of things. James 4.17 says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Now, I don't know if not stopping to help somebody when you get a prompting is an actual sin, I don't really think it matters. What I do think matters is 
having a heart that's open enough to hear from God that when you ought to do something, when there is a prompting, when you ought to make the right decision in something, I think that's the more important question to ask is, am I willing and open enough to hear God or hear the Holy Spirit working inside of me to do that the right way? And a lot of important decisions, unfortunately, not like little decisions, but a lot of important decisions that we make, we make them subconsciously. We make them and we don't even think about it. Now, now think about this. If your worldview is off, if you think that it's okay to fudge the numbers, if you think that it's okay to stick up to your, uh, for yourself to your spouse and just fire right back and not say, hey, did you have a rough day? You know, do you want to talk? Whatever you find your own scenario. If you think it's okay to not respond in a godly way, and that's your natural reaction... Do you think you will, for the most part, have a life of peace or a life of trouble and turmoil and more problems than you would like to say? Probably option number two. So we've got to be very, very cautious. It's a scary thing if our worldview is off. So we need to think constantly. We've got to be conscious that we're making choices, 35,000 a day, that we have to actually choose. But are we making choices through the lens of God's word? Are you, have you put yourself in a position in life to where you are regularly experiencing God's word? Not just on a Sunday, that's great. I'm so glad you're here. I hope you're listening. I, I, I hope you're taking notes. I want you to soak in all of this. But hopefully it's not just one day a week because guess what? There's six other days out there that you are going to be tempted to respond in a worldly way, not in a godly way. And it is not going to take you where you want or where God wants you, even more importantly. So I want you to challenge your worldview, challenge the way that you think about things, challenge the way that you see things, and try to make them, try to put them more correctly, more in a way that it's going to honor God and reflect what he has for us in his word. So I want to throw out a challenge here. <clears throat> think constantly but correctly. Here's our challenge. I want you to, now this is a big challenge. Maybe you'll get one or two. I'm asking for three. I'm going big or go home, okay? I want you to make three God-honoring decisions that are normally out of character for you. Now this is a big ask, okay? Three decisions, like, and I, <laughs> I want you to pray that God would put you in situations. That's the key to this. God, would you put me in a situation that makes me rubber meets the road kind of deal? That God, I would have to make a decision that's going to honor you. That's going to think, you know, consider some thought like, oh, this is going to be hard, but God, I really feel like you want me to do this thing. Like, like, Stopping on the side of the road. You're driving down the road. There's a single mom. Kids are in the car. Flat tire. And she's staring into her trunk, looking at all of the stuff back there, hoping that there's even a tire there that she doesn't see, but she doesn't know that it's under that dumb panel that's in there and they hide the tire from you. Okay? She doesn't know that. You know that. And that thought hits your mind like, oh, I know I should stop. I, 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 I can have that tire changed in like 10 minutes, but like I'm meeting my friends and we're going to play pickleball or what, I don't, sorry guys, you play pickleball. I, I knew I was going to be picking on you if I said that, but like I'm going to do something else. It was the only thing that came to my mind. I, 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 I've got plans. I'm late for whatever. 
and you're challenged to not stop, but you're just still like, oh, it's not leaving me. I think I should stop. I think I should turn around and go help her. Guess what? That's probably God saying, hey, you can go help. You know what happens in those times? You stop, you help, they're very thankful. There's no telling what that person's going through. There's no telling what she's experienced, and, and, and who knows? I mean, this, this flat tire could be the least of all her concerns. And it opens up a little bit of an opportunity for you just to say, hey, do you, are, you, are you in a good church? Hey, you know, I, man, I, I can see you're having a rough day. You know what helps me when I have rough days? And, and just to maybe start a God conversation with that person. Maybe God's prompting you to finally have a God conversation at work. Maybe like there's this chatter and stuff and you're like this closet Christian at work. Maybe it's about time that you start that conversation or at least invite them to church. Bring them here. Let me do all the hard work. That's what I do. But I want us to make three God-honoring decisions that are normally out of character. So here's some questions you can ask. God, what do you want me to do in this situation? God, how can I bring you glory with this? And God, how can I move forward with this decision in a way that honors you and blesses someone else? Church, we have to think differently. We have to think in God-honoring ways. Not because that just God commands it because he's all about rules, but because when we understand that when we start to gear our life more towards what God wants for us, it's an absolute game changer. Think constantly but correctly. If you don't, you'll miss what God has for you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you didn't look down on us in our sin, in our shame, and feel a prompting to do something about it and then decide, nah, they got themselves into this mess. Thank you, God, that you made a way for us through your son, Jesus, that he stepped out of his comfort zone, out of heaven itself, to come here and live among us, to die for us, and three days later to rise again. Thank you, God, that you are so faithful to us. God, thank you that you are always, always making decisions that are for our good and for your glory. God, help us to get on board with that. God, help us to trust you. God, we, we want to live our lives in a way that it's, it's, it's our own and in our pride and in our junk and our preferences. God, help us to forget about all of that. God, help your word be the only source of truth in our lives. Not our feelings, God. Your word and what your word says. Thank you, God, that we do have truth, like we'll talk about next week, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. God, I know there are some here this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who have not accepted the free gift of salvation, who do not have an actual relationship with you. They know some stuff about God. They've attended church. They've done the religion, spirituality thing, but they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. Right now in this moment, God, would you convict hearts? Those who do not know you, just speak to their hearts, God, that they need a Savior. That God, in their sin, in our sin, we are condemned. 
but through your son Jesus, we can be saved. So right now in this moment, if that's you, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Right where you're sitting, would you just say, God, I need you. I'm tired of doing this on my own. I trust in your son, Jesus, to be my savior. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I'd love to know. I'm not going to call you out, but just would you just slip your hand up so I can pray for you, be praying for you. Say, I got it today. Would you just put your hand up? Say, today I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Today is the day I got it. Thank you. Thank you, God, that you are so good. Thank you, God. God, we lift up this time of offering. God, may we be a generous church. May we bless this community. God, may we bless this world in a way that it brings honor and glory to you. God, help us to further your kingdom in any way that we can. And we pray all this in your awesome, holy name, the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.